This is World AIDS Day Worldwide. World AIDS Day Worldwide. Hello and thanks for joining us. I'm Shannon Power. In this hour, we're exploring what's holding us back, how do we move faster, and this hour's topic is stigma. Please join the global conversation by emailing onair at joy.org.au. That's onair at joy.org.au or join the conversation on Twitter using the hashtag joywad. Uh, it's 7pm here in Melbourne, one thirty pm in Mumbai and about 9am in Rome. So if you're joining us from overseas, welcome. Our guests over the next hour include Alastair Hudson, the country coordinator for the HIV Stigma Index in the UK. And for a local perspective, we have lobbyist and Enough Ambassador Ian Smith. And joining me in the studio, we have Lucy Stackpole-Moore, the Secretariat for AIDS 2014, Media and Communication in Australia. And Lucy has just completed a PhD on stigma, HIV and the law in Malawi. So as the world comes to terms with the beginning of a fourth decade with HIV, World AIDS Day Worldwide will analyse the history of HIV and AIDS to gain an understanding of the evolution of the epidemic, government policy, scientific research, medical advancement and community engagement framed by historical understanding must align if we are to continue to make strides in the response to HIV. Now, HIV-related stigma affects everyone, gain straight, HIV positive and HIV negative, but most people have no understanding of its ramifications. Sometimes people find it hard to recognise stigma or articulate their response to it. HIV-related stigma and discrimination remain among the biggest challenges impeding progress in responses to HIV around the world. And we're going to take a global look at stigma relating to HIV and how it perpetuates the transference of the virus. So we've got lots of guests uh, for this hour. Let's start with Alistair, who's over in the UK. Uh, he is the country coordinator for the UK of people living with the HIV stigma index. Welcome to Joy 94.9, Alistair. Thanks for joining us. Alistair. I'm in London. Uh, oh, you're in London. Fantastic. What time is it over in London at the moment, Alistair? Four minutes past eight. In the morning? In the morning. <laughs> Thank I've had you. My second coffee. <laughs> Thank you for getting up very early in the morning and chatting to us. So the HIV stigma index is a, is a huge uh, global index, uh, you know, measuring uh, HIV stigma. To date, over 80 countries have worked with the index. Now, the UK was the first, uh, first uh, developed country to roll out the index, and they're repeating that. We'll love to talk to you a little bit about that as well. Uh, so Ian Smith is on the phone from Adelaide and he co-founded the Bespoke Approach in July 2008 and uh, works with a lot of different international businesses across Australia and internationally. And of course, uh, Ian Smith is not only married to the very lovely Natasha Stotts-Spoyer, but they are both ambassadors for the Enough campaign, which is the only campaign in <coughs> Australia uh, which aims to end HIV stigma. Ian, welcome to Join 94.9. Thanks for speaking with us. Hi, Shannon, and uh, it, my saving grace is being married to Natasha. <laughs> <laughs> well, we, we love having you on board the Enough campaign. We can't thank you enough for being involved. And Lucy's in the studio with us, um, who is working on the huge, massive AIDS 2014 conference and has completed a, a PhD in HIV and stigma in Malawi. So I think we, it's fair to say that we have three experts on the line who can talk to about us about their experiences and why they're involved in trying to wipe out HIV stigma. Lucy, let's start with you. You've been involved in the HIV sector for a very, very long time and um, stigma has really come to the forefront. I guess over the, maybe the past 10 years, we'll say sort of generally as one of the main, um, one of the main factors in, in helping us to, to treat HIV. Why, why has that suddenly become the new, new vogue thing, new thing in fashion to, to treat and talk about? I think, um, thanks Shannon, that's a great question and I think one of the things is we've started to realise that stigma is complicated and is different for different people but that that it's a, in essence it's something that can affect everyone in a different way and one of the benefits of all of the progress to, around access to treatment, new technologies around treatments and prevention and all of these things is we can actually focus on the complexity of stigma and understand better about how it might limit someone in their ability to go for an HIV test, how it might affect how someone feels about taking their tablets every day if it's reminding them of something that they're not 
or that they're ashamed about or something that's affecting their self-esteem, that reminder every day of having to take a pill can have a profound effect. And I think because the conversation has moved on from the early days where it's about fear and about death and about dying, we can actually start to really understand the different ways that stigma has an impact on every aspect of the epidemic. And is that universal? I mean, we can speak on that, you know, in developed countries and in the Western world. Does this, does stigma apply universally across different countries or is it the same experience for everyone? Yeah, I think stigma is the same, actually. I think the, that process of feeling devalued is the same. What What is different is the different triggers that it that causes that for different individuals in different contexts, as well as the different sources of support that people can reach out to to overcome that stigma. And that's really different for any individual in any context around the world. But that, that feeling of feeling undervalued, of, of feeling like you're in a shadow of yourself. I think that's that's a universal feeling, um, but the triggers of that are really different. Yes, yeah. absolutely. Now, Alistair, you're involved in the People Living with HIV Stigma Index, which is a huge project. Um, it's been rolled out in 80 countries around the world. Uh, now, the UK was the first country, developed country to roll out the index, and you're repeating the process this year. You're the country coordinator for that. Can you talk us through a little bit about what the HIV Stigma Index actually is and what it does? Stigma Index um, essentially is a tool. It's, um, it's a resource instrument, um, a, re a research instrument, if you like, that captures the community response to lived HIV um, stigma. Um, a lot of people in our community have been researched out in that, you know, there's survey monkeys galore, there's research programs that you're asked to engage with, but this was the first time that a community response had ever been captured. So um, the instrument, if you like, is 17 pages long, so it's quite long, and it captures um, people's lived experience within a 12-month period, and we rolled it out in 2009. And we worked with 876 people, I think. It seems like such a long time ago now. Um, from across um, the UK community, different ages, races, faiths, sexualities, genders. And um, the, the results were astonishing because it was the first time that people had actually been approached by their peers rather than by either academic institutions or medical bodies to kind of, you know, speak to them about what it felt like. And there's something incredibly empowering and um, freeing, I believe, about somebody who is living with that moment when they've experienced somebody saying, your result is positive, rather than someone who hasn't. It, it kind of opens a, a communication stream that maybe wouldn't happen in normal research models. So we're excited to be revisiting it next year. So with the HIV stigma index, what, is, what are the outcomes of it? What are the objectives of, of completing the, the research? I think for lots of people, it's lots of different things. I mean, when I got involved in it, I had just been diagnosed with HIV for nine months. So um, it was about a learning experience. But we gathered 35 community researchers from across our community, um, someone who'd been living with HIV for about 26 years at the time, um, was probably our elder. And, um, and and a whole range in the middle of that. And everybody had different experiences. You know, some people were coming along because it was a job. They wanted to learn about research. Um, some people wanted to support their community. And some people were just really curious to find out where this, um, this unmeasurable, often intangible thing called stigma lives. I mean, I, I think, you know, stigma is a wee bit like toothache. It, um, it doesn't mean anything to you until you've actually felt it inside your own head. You know, everybody's got different experiences of it, but no matter how much you read, and we've all read loads, because it's a subject that's hot and in some ways sexy to um, researchers and academics. But I think until you've actually had an experience of somebody either rejecting you in a gay bar for disclosure or a woman who approaches a medical service to say she wants to start a family and she's HIV positive and just gets a look. It can be as simple as a look, and it just changes your map of the world. But until you've had that lived experience it's just somebody else's shtick fantastic so ian smith you're you're based in adelaide and i guess um your experience is a little bit different you're not a researcher in hiv uh you're not living with hiv yourself you you're a you're a lobbyist you you know you uh, are a politician as well or used to be um and it sort of came out of left field that yeah. you were stepping up and uh, joining the Enough Ambassador team. And for full disclosure to our listeners, I am the Enough Campaign Coordinator for Living Positive Victoria um, and also a joy presenter, obviously. But because I guess you do come from sort of more that right 
field, conservative yeah. part of life. People yeah. were quite surprised when you jumped on board. You don't really have that traditional background in the HIV sector. What no, brought no, you? Not at all. Not what? at all. And, um, and, you know, why are you here, Ian? <laughs> well, why am Welcome. I here? I'm, uh, I'm here because I think that, I mean, to, to, to the classic point, a heterosexual conservative male should be out there telling people that there should be no stigma attached to people with, you know, with HIV, indeed, with any form of, uh, of, of, of infection. And, and, and I, I mean, the more I looked at it, um, and, you know, I, I wasn't a former politician, but a former political advisor, and I've, I've, I've come through and I've always been aligned more with the, if you like, the conservative side of politics. And Alistair, that goes back to when I was at college in London and tried to start the Tory club at the London College of Printing in the, in the Elephant and Castle. <laughs> <laughs> and and I, was the, I was the only member. Nobody else wanted to do it. They <laughs> on the other side of politics. That was in, that, that was in Thatcher's Britain. But that, that's another story. But I, look, I, I, think, I think it's really, really important for people like myself to take a, a, a stand to become involved. I have had the absolute privilege, Shannon, of meeting, you know, the guys at Living Positive and Brent and uh, th those guys, and to be asked is a privilege. So to get involved, I'm enthusiastic. And I mean, I, I talk to my mates about it. I talk to people in business about it. And I'm fortunate enough to deal with people at senior levels of business and senior levels of politics. And if if one can make a slight difference in a in 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 saying to people, you know, for God's sake, um, you know, get a grip. There should be no stigma attached. That's a, uh, a simple but powerful message, and that's what I intend to do. So what originally attracted you, Ian, to wanting to fight against HIV stigma? Because there are a lot of causes out there that you could have put your name to and your efforts to, but particularly for both yourself and your wife, Natasha, well, why did you join forces to fight stigma? Well, Natasha, I, I, it's interesting. You... you <laughs> Obviously, from someone like Natasha, learn a huge amount. But um, I mean, she has always she she's she's always fought for a range of uh, of, of groups in society, and uh, you know, I, it's it. She was often described as perhaps the most popular uh, politician when it came to representing the interests of uh, the gay and lesbian community. She was a leader, and you know, I came into that 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 sort of understanding that world. Um, uh, you know, I, I was naive, and I think. Um, I think, you know, quite frankly, you know, what, what I want to ward against, and it's interesting, it's been very much a discussion today on, on World AIDS Day, and you see, you know, I was, I was noticing today that, you know, the UN Secretary General saying that, you know, the, the rate is going down, but what I have learned from speaking to, 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 to you guys at, at Enough and, and, and elsewhere is that we've got to be really cautious of complacency, we've got to be really cautious that hang on, we're on top of this thing. Um, and that requires a number of people to be out there saying to whomever it is, whether it's, uh, and in my case, you know, I, I want to, you know, promote to, to uh, if you like, men, um, straight, gay men, whatever, to, to say, look, get, you know, we should all be tested. We should all make sure that, uh, um, that, uh, that, we, that we are doing our bit to help you know, ward against complacency and continue to take the, uh, the, the, the levels down. So as the Secretary General, you know, uh, you know post 2015, he wants it to be to almost a negligible level globally. Uh, we want to eradicate it, clearly. But um, it, it's, it's, it, it's just something, at the end of the day, there should be no stigma applied to it. And, and the more I've learned, the more I thought, well, this isn't a this isn't a cause that you, this is not a difficult cause. It's a, it's a cause of common sense. Absolutely. I mean, you, you raise some very good points and I guess the, the, the benefit of having someone like yourself on board uh, the Enough campaign to fight stigma is that stigma comes from everywhere in society. It's not just from Absolutely. within the, in the sector. So it's important to have a range of voices fighting, um, fighting the issue. Now, Alistair, you, you know, um, you're a gay man who was only diagnosed a few years ago. Traditionally, I guess people in your age group have been living with HIV for, for a number of years. Can you just explain to me what it's been like for yourself having only been quite recently diagnosed with HIV in the past five years and what sort of stigma you may have experienced as someone who was diagnosed at a time where medicine and education was far more advanced than it was, say, 20, 30 years ago? 
I, I, um, I guess essentially I feel very privileged to be living in the UK at the time I do, um, where I do and how I do. I have an incredible medic, um, a doctor who I was very clear. I just wanted him to choreograph it and let me dance it, if you like. Um, I, um, I, I kind of lived through HIV in the kind of early 90s, living in London, where it wasn't the way it is now. So when I was diagnosed, it was very clear. For me, it was a, a conversation about, oh, my goodness, how am I going to live with this? Not, oh, my God, I'm going to die from this. Mm. Um, and I think, you know, with the medical resources that we have in this country, that's kind of what's been presented now for most people. Um, so for me, it's, it's something that I um, get on with. It's, it's essentially four tablets at bedtime. It doesn't come alone, so I wouldn't advise anyone to go shopping for it. Um, but my, my, my relationship to HIV um, has been um, something that in some ways has informed my life in ways that I didn't expect it to. You know, it's given me a new kind of um, prism, if you like, to communicate with, um, you know, how I view myself sexually, you know, professionally to a certain extent. But I think because we have a, a resourced medical model in the UK, it's a very, very different environment, you know, for me to speak to countries that don't have access to treatment and and even prevention and care the way that we do would, would be foolish. I think the people that we interviewed in the index, there was a whole range of people um, who had different experiences. It's a, it's, a, it's a big country, the UK, for such a small island, and um, there are places that services aren't the way they are in London. And I think that's the thing that's been looked at, you know, I mean, what a, the Stigma Index wrote a resource last year for um, teachers, UK teachers, to support teachers to be effective in classrooms. And we found some shocking stories about teachers that were expected to teach something that they perceived as being technically challenging and a bit scary, but they had had no support at all. You know, so we were looking at kind of um, trying to get young people um, in classrooms the right education. Lucy, there's a there's a sense of you know the the treatment for HIV over the 30 years since we we discovered the virus has changed and it's come forward quite a bit, but the stigma and the attitudes sort of have remained stagnant and are kind of the same and haven't really changed. Is that something you'd agree with, or do you think stigma's evolved as well? Um, no, I think well as I said before, I think the feeling of stigma is the same, but I think our understanding of it is evolving. I think it needs to evolve a bit further. But even in things like the demographic health survey, we still ask some pretty rudimentary questions to measure stigma, like would you buy fruit from a fruit vendor who you know is HIV positive? And at the end of the day, I don't think that's really getting to the nuts and bolts of what stigma is and how people experience it about you know what banana or apple they take home from whom, you know. Um, and I think in terms of yeah, it, it's it's changed and. But the essence of what stigma is, is an ex it goes back to the ancient Greeks. You know, stigma is a, um, the word stigmata is a, is a mark or a blemish and it's, it's around exclusion and those things. And they're fundamentals that won't ever change. It's what stigma is, it's what stigma means for people and will continue to mean for hundreds and thousands of years, whether that's around HIV or around other things that people feel stigmatised for. Um, but I really think that what we have gotten more sophisticated at is articulating where stigma exists, what causes it and potentially how different people have been able to overcome stigma at different times in their life. You're on Joy 94.9. It is the special broadcast World AIDS Day worldwide. You can join the conversation by emailing onair at joy.org.au um, and the Twitter hashtag is joywad. I'm joined on the line by Alistair Hudson, Ian Smith and Lucy as well. Now, Lucy, I wanted to ask you, it's a really big deal today in Melbourne. We have Aung San Suu Kyi here, who is the global advocate to end stigma against people <coughs> living with HIV, which is a really huge deal. We have the executive director of UNAIDS here also sort of really trying to drive home the message that they want to achieve zero discrimination. Now, you were saying a little bit earlier on that you believe that there's a difference between discrimination and stigma. Could you articulate that for us? Yeah, thank you. And I think Aung, Aung San Suu Kyi, I mean, we were so lucky to have her today. What an incredible woman and so inspiring. And she made this important distinction between the mind and the heart in terms of where we need to go in overcoming things. And I think that's quite a simple way to understand the difference between stigma and discrimination, where stigma is something very much that you feel in your heart. It's, 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 it's a feeling, whereas discrimination is a little bit more rational and is something it's an action it's something you can see and something that you can more clearly articulate or define whereas stigma is quite an abstract concept but a very strong feeling if you like um, that's how I'd describe it anyway 
Yeah, so Ian Smith, you've been a, an ambassador with Enough now for, uh, I guess, a little over 12 months, if yeah. I'm correct. What what sort of advances have you seen in that time or changes have you seen? And what would you like to see change while you are um, the Enough ambassador? Well, it's interesting. Um, what have I seen? I, I mean, I, I suppose when I started, I had... Uh, I, I, I had assumptions. I had uh, um, you know, no, no base from which to work from. I, I, in speaking with people about my role, and, and that is the role of an ambassador to, uh, to, to talk about it and to uh, help remove that stigma, I have been pleasantly surprised by, by, uh, by the way people are in general. I think I, one of our greatest um, opportunities, and I don't say challenge, is you know, I put on my you know, ribbon today, and uh, and as uh, you know, wandered off down to the kiosk, I um, and sat down with everyone, and people said, "Oh, you're wearing um, that? That's World AIDS Day, isn't it?" Yes, and uh, there was an awareness. And talking to my eight-year-old and five-year-old, and I, I, you know, without sounding too too sort of emotive about the whole thing, but I think through kids, through this is where we have the great opportunity. You know, to my children, you know, you talk to them about. Whatever it is, in this case, it's it's HIV and and AIDS, and why do you wear it, Dad? And what what does it mean? And you talk to them, and you see a tremendous sort of acceptance, as it should be, and 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 no no fear, no worry, as it should be. And I think, um, you know, I my I've I suppose it's one. I'm I'm a glass half full sort of person, but I've been tremendously pleased with the engagement that people have around the subject matter. To talk about it, to say, well, yeah, there should be there should be no stigma attached, and um, you know, I think it's one of those cases. The more we talk about it, the better. But what worries me, and again, from reading literature, is that because we seem to be getting on top of it, we have to ward against the complacency, and so it's it's like anything, you know, your strength becomes your weakness. Um, and um, I, I mean, I'm fascinated to hear of uh, of the work that Alistair's doing with that stigma index and. You know, it'd be fascinating to see how it has changed. And but whether do you reach a plateau? Do you reach a level where, you know, it's always difficult. It's it's always difficult to get below that level um, um, to, to to you know for total acceptance or if you like no stigma, destigmatize. So, no, I've been happy and and pleasantly surprised. Now I know, Ian, we do have to let you go very soon. But we have had an email come in from James that says, "If only all parents were like Ian." <laughs> so there's some there's some feedback on your parenting <laughs> skills there, Ian. Now, just out of curiosity, you do work sort of in the upper echelons of Australian politics and business. When you talk to people um, in those realms, you picture them to be sort of a bit sort of stuffy white collar <laughs> white collar workers. How do they react when you tell them you're an, an enough ambassador to fight HIV stigma? I think we give our politicians a really rough uh, impression, and, and I, and I uh, you know, it's, it's that sort of five-second, six-second grab type scenario. There is an amazing desire of the overwhelming number of people in public life, in public service, in politics, to make a difference, and I think it's incumbent upon us to tell people, to tell them about it, to educate them about it. And in short, I would say that, you know. For us in this group, in this, in this community who want to destigmatize HIV, what we should be doing is telling people the facts, telling people that normal lives, I mean, good God, listen to Alistair. I mean, what, a, what an inspiration, you know, living as he should be with uh, a, a normal life, taking four tablets a night. That's many people take four tablets a night. I uh, take one for a bad back, but it's no different. And, and I think but what we must do is continue that education process. And we should remember that so many things come across a politician's desk that you can't expect people to know. And that is, the, in one sense, there are many poor images of lobbying, but we have to lobby people to understand what it is we're trying to achieve. And, um, you know, I suppose that's, 
that's the very small part I can play. And it's, and it's a, as I say, a pleasure and a privilege to play it. Absolutely. Well, we all have to work very hard to fight stigma. I need to say a big thank you to Ian Smith, the Enough Ambassador, for joining us. We are with Alistair Hudson and Lucy Stackpool-Moore. We would love you to join our global conversation through the hashtag JoyWAD on Twitter or email us directly via onair at joy.org.au. Coming up very soon is our exclusive interview with the UNA's Executive Director, Michelle Sidibe. We'll be back with your comments and questions after these messages from our partners in this global project. Thank you so much, Ian, for your time. Thank you. This is World AIDS Day Worldwide. This is World AIDS Day Worldwide. I'm Shannon Power and we are on World, Aid, World AIDS Day Worldwide.org here at Joy 94.9. And in this hour, we're exploring what's holding us back. How do we move faster? And this hour's topic is stigma. We have Lucy in the in the studio with us and Alistair Hudson is over in the UK. Um, so Alistair, I was chatting to you a little bit earlier before about the fact that you were sort of only diagnosed five years ago, which is relatively recently. Um, I was sort of curious, does, was your diagnosis what led you to become involved in the HIV stigma index and sort of uh, become involved in that sector? Or is that something you're always passionate about? I'm always passionate about perhaps no. I mean, I in the early 90s, I had various friends who, you know, um, lived and died with and from HIV. Um, many of them are still with us, thankfully, but um, quite a few of them aren't. I, I got involved, I guess, essentially because I just wanted to know the facts. I mean, the opportunity came up to be involved as a trainer um, with the Stigma Index initially to kind of do some comms training, which is the world that I lived in before um, I got involved with the index. So initially it was going to be a two-day training gig. I was going to rock up and be involved in this training. I didn't realise I was going to kind of start to care as passionately about the issues um, as, I, as I did. Um, so it kind of grew into a, a kind of job and then one thing leads to another and before you know where you are, you're working in what is known as the sector, whatever that means. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I'm always wary of that being branded as someone who works in the sector because in the five years that I've been involved, it's changed quite dramatically. Um, we initially worked with 35 organisations in the UK and many of them are no longer um, here. And maybe that's shrinkage, natural wastage. It's just how things are evolving because they're becoming more streamlined and hopefully more effective. Um, but I guess the reason that I got involved is initially I just wanted to know the facts. As somebody who was newly diagnosed, I honestly thought if I get in and do six months on this project, I can ask all the questions I need to know um, and then go on with my life. Um, in the middle of it, I started treatment and um, the, um, the researchers that I was working with were incredible. You know, just kind of grassroots, old fashioned peer support. What's it going to be like when I take these tablets? I'm a bit scared. That's code for terrified. Um, and, and there were people there that just kind of, you know, gave me a cuddle and a kick in the backside when I needed it and um, just supported me. And that, I think, is something that will always be necessary and invaluable for anybody living with an HIV diagnosis. But I think, you know, in terms of austerity, certainly in the UK, those support mechanisms are becoming more challenging to fund. Um, and, and I just hope that we don't lose the essential bits of it as we move towards a more streamlined treatment as prevention um, strategy and um, people being asked to do less for more, more for less. Now, I do want to play uh, the exclusive interview that we have with Michelle Sidibe, the Executive Director of UNAIDS, but I'm going to ask both of you a question which we'll talk about in just a moment, but we'll give you some thinking time. We've had an email come through um, at onair at joy.org.au, which our listeners can feel free to continue to email through questions. The question is, does stigma play an important part in making sure people are less complacent in becoming HIV positive? Have a think about that. We'll talk about that um, idea in just a moment. But first, I wanted to play the exclusive interview that I did yesterday with the Under Secretary General of the United Nations and the Executive Director of UNAIDS, Michelle Sidibe, who is in Melbourne for World AIDS Day and to also launch the Zero Discrimination Campaign and also the huge AIDS 2014 conference. Here's the interview that I did yesterday. Okay. All right, so fantastic. You're here for World AIDS Day, but also to launch the big AIDS 2014 conference in Melbourne. What's your, been your experience so far here in Melbourne? You know, I, uh, I think it will be one of the best uh, uh, World AIDS uh, conference in Melbourne. 
Why? Because uh, people are excited about this conference. They want to continue to demonstrate that people will not travel from so far to come here and to be disappointed. They want to show that the human right uh, will be central to the agenda, that exclusion will be re rejected, that the people will say enough is enough. Let us give chance uh, to social solidarity. Let us make sure that uh, uh, social justice will be central to our agenda. I think uh, Melbourne will be one of the best, like I said, uh, World AIDS Conference. Fantastic. We're very happy to hear that. Now, stigma has come to the forefront for many HIV organisations. Why has that happened and why is stigma such an important part of HIV treatment? You know, I call for zero discrimination and I could not have a better advocate uh, than uh, Aung San Suu Kyi. When she, I told her, could you be the global advocate for uh, zero discrimination? She said, you know, I refuse to be advocate for anything except uh, Myanmar. But uh, this cause is, is so important for me that I cannot say no to you. I will be your advocate for zero discrimination. Zero discrimination is uh, certainly the most important goal we need to achieve. Because it is, it is our decision to have uh, 41 countries in the world today who refuse people with uh, HIV to travel in or out. So it is our decision to not have um, a punitive laws. Uh, 71 homophobic countries uh, today, why we will exclude people from life-saving services because uh, uh, for uh, what they are or for who they love? So for me, that is uh, why stigma discrimination will continue to be an important agenda. We'll never end AIDS if we don't end uh, uh, discrimination. Fantastic. Now, Aung San Suu Kyi, who is a global advocate of zero discrimination, she says he who discriminates narrows the world of others as well as his own. In the end, he's leading us into a world in which we cannot be open, we cannot flower, we cannot blossom. And the symbol for zero discrimination is the butterfly. What does it mean having someone like Aung San Suu Kyi choose to be a global advocate for zero discrimination? I, I, I think uh, it means a lot. It means uh, that uh, uh, she is uh, a true leader, a leader for uh, inclusiveness. Uh, she is a leader who, which will, uh, who will help us uh, to certainly uh, bring a society around the dignity of people. And uh, for me, nothing is uh, more beauty than having uh, Aung San Suu Kyi, who fought all her life for social justice, for uh, giving voice to voiceless to be taking this role of a global advocate for zero discrimination. Fantastic. Now, we also know that people that live with HIV experience stigma from society and culture, but there's also an internalised stigma that people living with HIV um, experience. What, why is that also important to challenge and why do we have to, how do we, how do we incorporate that into treatment? You know, I think uh, we need uh, to help uh, people to live uh, positively. And that is uh, what was uh, happening with uh, the movement, uh, living positively. Because they try to demonstrate uh, that uh, uh, there is not just about pill. It's not uh, just receiving uh, a, a, a medicine. It's about uh, restoring their dignity, making sure that people consider them uh, as uh, any other uh, human being. And uh, for me, again, uh, this uh, stigma, discrimination, uh, prejudice are killing people. And we need uh, to stop uh, those uh, prejudices against our own people. Fantastic. Now, people watching this broadcast or listening to it on Joy 94.9, what can they do on a daily basis to help end stigma against people living with HIV? Compassion, love and making sure that uh, they can understand those human beings or just human beings. And they can also sign the pledge at enough.org.au, just like you did. Yes, I think they should uh, sign a visa pledge and say enough is enough. Fantastic. And, uh, making sure that uh, we bring a, a new solidarity and we continue to make uh, the world better. Fantastic. Michelle Sibade, thank you so much for your time. Thank you very much. We're on World AIDS Day worldwide on Joy 94.9. We just heard from the Executive Director of UN AIDS, Michelle Sidibe. I have in the studio with me Lucy Stackpoolmore, who's been working in HIV for a long time. And on the line from London is Alastair Hudson, who's been working with the HIV Stigma Index. So the question I put to both of you before, and Lucy, I'd love for you to answer this one because I know you feel very strongly about it. And I'll repeat it now. 
does stigma play an important part in making sure people are less complacent in becoming HIV positive? Thanks, Shannon. I think it's a really good question because I think we often forget that people deliberately use stigma to try and control people, to try and control people's behaviour and actually to try and keep people marginalised or excluded from certain things in the case of HIV in relation to who they have sex with, what kind of recreational habits they might have and those kind of things. And you can see actually that stigma really is a political process. It's highly politicised through the laws that are made, the kind of policies that are in place as to who can access treatment for free, for example, if you're an undocumented migrant. Um, it's really difficult for you to get free treatment, but there might be a different policy that says, no, 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 treatment is available for everybody. Um, and so, yeah, I think th it's not really about complacency in that. It's really about deliberately evoking fear to try and control people based on an aspect of, of who they are and their identity. And I don't think that's right because it's diminishing the sense of someone's self or a sense of someone's soul. But for somebody else's objective. So you're putting the public health of everybody ahead of the, the health of the person living with HIV by deliberately using stigma to try and limit their treatment, for example. Um, and in the case of prevention, you can see actually how stigma is really detrimental because it can create a barrier for people to go for an HIV test or they might go for a test but fail to believe the positive result and so may not go back for another couple of weeks, couple of years even, and to actually delay then the access of health services in those cases can have really negative health outcomes and obviously in relation to someone's self-esteem and how they come to terms with a positive diagnosis. And it also applies to relationships and I want to talk to you Alistair about you know forming loving relationships in just a moment because we've had an email in from Brad who says as a HIV positive man here in Melbourne I feel the type of stigma that HIV carries has changed Nonetheless, it is still very real and needs to be challenged. Nowadays, I believe there is a greater understanding and tolerance of HIV. However, it is tolerated rather than accepted. Comments such as, are you clean? Typically, I respond to questions like this as, as a joke and say, yes, clean. I shower every day. But I know <laughs> this is not what they mean. And if pushed, uh, I challenge people to ask what they actually mean. I'd much sooner be open with somebody in a conversation where the language used is open and not designed to put sections of the community down. Now, we know that people living with HIV often feel that they can't enter into a, a committed relationship, a sexual relationship, because they are living with HIV, which is not the case at all. Alistair, can you tell us a little bit about your experience as someone who was, I guess, recently diagnosed and how that has affected your relationships or even, you know, people that you may know and um, the impact that HIV has had on that? I love, I love the recently diagnosed. Five years ago, it feels like a life. <laughs> I mean, I'm 45 years old. It seems like a long, long time ago. It was still this millennium, so it counts. <laughs> okay, you win. You don't win clean, but you win. Um, I mean, when I was at school, um, 84, the Don't Die of Ignorance campaign <clears throat> started in the UK. It was the first major prevention campaign we had here. And Don't Die of Ignorance was like minor descending cords and, you know, mountains collapsing. It was kind of a bit bleak, dark grey, monochrome. And all it really said to a 14-year-old schoolboy in Glasgow with a bit more pizzazz than your average 14-year-old schoolboy in Glasgow, um, thou shalt not have sex or thou shalt die. Um, for me, moving through and seeing how that's changed, for me it was about learning vocabularies to disclose effectively. Um, and and keep my dignity, whatever that means. I mean, for me, I made a decision to be um, straightforward about my um, diagnosis. But again, I was supported by incredible people to develop those vocabularies. I mean, relationships are tough for anybody, I think, whether you're gay, straight, HIV positive or otherwise. Um, and it's, you know, it's a, it's a minefield that you have to kind of navigate in your own way at your own time. I mean, I too have heard, are you clean? Which to me just seems slightly ridiculous. But I mean, you know, I'm in a different place to many people. Um, I'm in a relationship um, which has been going on for about approaching two years now. Um, and we had the conversation and things moved through. But again, it's like, I, I don't think there's any quick fix answer for that one. I mean, it's... It, it, it's a difficult, a difficult land to navigate. I mean, in terms of the stigma, I mean, you know, if you just look at how it's been used, I just caution anybody who's developing any campaigns to do it from an open-hearted place that will be inclusive and please, please, you know, test it on people that are going to be living with HIV because they're going to be your best audience as a first port of call. Now, when you say campaigns, Alistair, what, what do you mean specifically campaigns? 
Well, I mean, in the UK, we haven't had a major, you know, national HIV prevention campaign for some time. You know, there are various agencies that are doing various things, but, you know, HIV infection is still a huge issue here, as it is in most countries. Regardless of being resourced and having, you know, thrown thousands, nay, millions of pounds at prevention campaigns, there still is an issue with people accessing testing. We've recently, um, as I said earlier, worked with um, UK teachers because we wanted to kind of create a sexually intelligent workforce in classrooms that would feel equipped to kind of give young people a vocabulary and, and, and strategy for their own sexual wellness so that when they start going to mum and dad with it's going to the dentist without mum and dad, they might contemplate sexual testing every year as part of their general wellness. So it just becomes part of the fabric of how a young person would move through their teens, 20s, sexually active time to, you know, a time that they might not need testing anymore, um, whenever that may be. Um, and, and we just found that a lot of people were really scared of, of kind of engaging in testing because they thought it would be a comment on who they were. And that's not the case. It should just become part of daily life. That's a really interesting point. I, I watched a um, a speech the other day about a girl was like, you know, I get my cle teeth cleaned every six months. I go and get a regular checkup at the doctor every year or whatever it was. And then I also get HIV and STI tested, however often she did it. What? How can, Lucy, how can we start to incorporate that regular kind of testing into everyday society and get that into the into our minds that it's something that everybody should do um, regardless of, of whether they're in a relationship or not it's just something that should be done shouldn't it really yeah I mean I think it's about you know how you live your life and being healthy you know in terms of looking after you, whether it's you know you're feeling ill and go to the doctor for some you know flu medication or something or you regularly are looking after your sexual health so you regularly go for a checkup for all sorts of STIs maybe family planning as well as an HIV test um, yeah. but then there's also some people that that's not relevant for in some ways you know and, and I think everyone that should manage their health and I completely believe that but I think one of the things we're getting better at in terms of the global response to HIV is actually really tailoring key prevention messages key access to healthcare messages key information services and support services for people who most need that so for example in a country where HIV is most prevalent among people who inject drugs, then really focusing on the people who need those services and those messages yep. and those, yeah, access to healthcare the most and not everybody in the kitchen sink in that country because in that particular epidemic context, it's really different for, and you need to, where there's probably limited resources, you really need to focus those for the people who most need them. The, the HIV though and transmission and, and, you know, who becomes infected is constantly changing most of the time. How do you, in that case, even if you have limited resources and you want to uh, focus on one particular part of the community that may be more at risk of, um, of contracting HIV, what happens if the, that demographic changes? How do you keep on top of that and sort of try and send out the messages to any potential um, you know, at-risk communities? Yeah, that's a great question. I think Alistair's example from the Stigma Index is a, is a perfect case study of that, saying, okay, first we really need to understand where stigma is, what impact it's having for people living with HIV in a specific context, so that you can then make an informed choice about where to best focus those resources, those energies, those support systems, remove those barriers for accessing services. But you first really need to understand what the barriers are and how they might have changed from five years ago. Stigma now is really, as we were talking about before, is really different from how it was 10, 15, 20, 25 years ago. And HIV is much more of a chronic illness for some people, not everybody, they still perceive it, everyone you know, has a different mind and a different heart. But it's really about meeting people and I people in different communities within different countries where they are and then responding to that. So I think first you really need to understand what the biggest concerns are in relation to stigma and how it's having an impact in terms of the response to HIV and then move from there and regularly check in that understanding to make sure it's up to date and relevant. Now Lisa, you've done a lot of work in Africa in various countries um, in relation to HIV and I know it's a very general question to ask about an entire continent, but how does stigma affect uh, communities over in Africa? Um, I think, yeah, I mean, as I was saying earlier, I think stigma is the same. It's that feeling about being devalued and whether you're living in the capital city of Malawi or living in a village in rural Senegal, I think that feeling is, is the same, but the biggest difference on it is maybe the resources that you have access to to overcome that stigma or even your peers or other people who might have disclosed to you their status and so you can reach out to them to help you 
travel your own journey with that diagnosis. Um, I think from my own research, one of I, my research was based on um, some interviews that I did with a, with a team in Malawi, and we it's based on life stories of people living with and affected by HIV. And one of the most interesting answers I received from was an amazing man based up in the north of Malawi. And I asked him for him what it was relating to friendship and one of the barriers he'd faced in terms of disclosure and the response he'd got from his friend. And he was describing how he'd first disclosed. And he said it, it had taken him, I think, six months to disclose to his friend that he was HIV positive. But when he did, and he was telling me the story, and he said, oh, my friend said, thank you so much for trusting me with that information. And, and I didn't have the courage to tell you this. I was diagnosed with HIV positive, I think, 18 months earlier or some period earlier. And it was just a really powerful thing. And, and he saw it as a sign of friendship and trust. And then they each could share that you know, journey together. And they both then accessed treatment and became a source of support for each other. But it had taken that courage, that trust, and that friendship to actually... Um, have that conversation and I think speaking out about HIV, speaking out about stigma is actually a really important part in the in the overcoming of stigma. Absolutely and that's something the, yep. um, the index in the UK has contributed to because the results uh, from the stigma index in the UK contributed to the Global Commission on HIV and the Criminalise Hate Not HIV campaign and I guess that's one of the objectives of the stigma index as well, Alistair, is advocacy for, for people living with HIV um, what's what's next for the HIV stigma index? Well, it's really exciting. We, we are looking to maybe be the first country to roll it out for the second time next year, um, uh, pending funding, which is um, which is looking hopeful. He says with both fingers crossed. <laughs> but um, but um, the, the exciting thing there's there's lots of things that have happened. We basically, as the community, if you like, presented our policy organisations in the UK with with um, a, a data set that they could use for advocacy. I mean, since then, there have been amazing things that have happened. We worked, we fed into the Global Commission on HIV and the Law, which you mentioned. But I mean, since then, there have been various changes in the UK. I mean, the Crown Prosecution Service and Procurator Fiscal's Office in Scotland have both um, developed guidelines for the policing of HIV. Now, there's still issues with that filtering down to frontline police, of course. But I mean, there are guidelines that are in place since we did this in 2009. Um, you know, there are resources in place for um, teachers and schools, but we're looking to get statutory um, SRE included meaningfully across the curricula in the UK. So there's still a lot of work to do. So hopefully this next rollout of the index will provide another kind of um, wave of data because we're moving towards a general election in the next two years here that um, our policy um, boards um, and them much wiser than I can use as evidence base from the community. The exciting thing about the index is that really it's the, it's the community voice. So you're actually maybe getting under the belly of some of the stories. I mean, Lucy spoke about the friendship thing. I mean, we did some qualitative research um, in the second phase of what we've done so far. And we had focus groups um, of people living with HIV together and seeing people even just share their stories like, you know, a man who disclosed to his priest in church in Scotland, being able to tell that story for the first time to his peers, the, the healing um, and, and release that, that sometimes that affords people is considerable. Just having somebody witness your life with something that you've found terrifying to disclose before can be phenomenal in terms of anyone's journey, I believe. And I'm so, I mean, there's a great lot of work to be done and, and we're really excited about, you know, gathering some of the energy that we had before because it was truly remarkable. I'd say miraculous, actually. <laughs> well, but it, I'm back. Of course. Well, we think you do pretty good work, Alistair. Um, I do need to say thank you very much to Alistair Hudson from the HIV Stigma Index for joining us all the way from frosty London on a Sunday morning <laughs> and uh, Lucy Stackpole-Moore for joining me in the studio. Best of luck with organising the huge AIDS 2014 thank conference. You. If anything is today to go by, it's going to be massive. None of us are going to get any sleep, but that's great <laughs> because we're forwarding the cause of HIV and hopefully, uh, you know, making big marks on stigma. In the next hour, Christian Vegas joins us with the theme, No One Left Behind. The topic is transgender. We encourage you strongly to join the conversation. You can email on air at joy.org.au. Join the conversation also on Twitter with the hashtag joywad. And you can watch us online, which is the World AIDS Day worldwide. I'm Shannon Power. That's it for me. There's plenty more to come. We're broadcasting right through until 6am. If you're heading out in Melbourne tonight, I strongly encourage you to go to the Circuit Bar. There isn't enough fundraiser. That's it from me. Bye.